welcome to now. No opportunity wasted with Angelica Ross. I am your host, Angelica Ross. This is a podcast and a movement focused on making the most out of life's opportunities and challenges. Right now, today, we're going to figure out, you know, how do we get through this stuff? And each person's challenges are different. That's why I'm sitting here and talking to as many people as I can to just understand how they were able to find a way and get through the challenges that they face and how they face, how they deal with opportunity. And right now on today's episode, I have the just wildly successful, but also my friend, Andre Perry. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for doing this. Absolutely. I really appreciate you for doing this. Sure, for sure. Um, now, I, you know, I don't have my notes in front of me. Um, and it was like a really long list <laughs> of like these major brands mm -hmm. that you have worked with from BET. Mm -hmm. I want to say, did I say Coca-Cola? Was that one of them? No. Not it? yet. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, you're going to, though. I think I just spoke for that sure. one into existence. Absolutely. Absolutely. But Nick, tell us some of the different brands that you've worked with. Okay. So I've worked across a gambit of brands. So from tech, so I work with Google, I work with Facebook, um, then to more so like into the sports world, I worked with Theragun, I work with Men's Health, um, and then I work with Propel Water, which is Wait, all hold on, sports. we're gonna pause a second, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That was, I didn't have a meeting with my agent, right? <laughs> okay, no, so my agent was just calling on my, oh, yeah, that's what was happening on my thing. So <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my, um, phone my uh because I'm, I'm actually gonna have you introduce yourself again but um mm -hmm. i'm going to turn my thing on do not disturb i barely know how to work this but <laughs> there we go do not disturb because we can just go in and, and edit go to my so i can list the brands properly okay go ahead yes <laughs> yes yeah no like pull it yeah pull it up so you can mm -hmm. you like go through it um and i'm just gonna read so we're still recording right awesome um, and I am here with none other than my friend and just amazing world renowned photographer, mm -hmm. Andre Perry. Welcome to now, Andre. Thank you for having me. Now, listen, Andre, tell the people mm -hmm. about the work that you do. Like, I'll just give them a light little something mm -hmm. like Andre is a photographer. Um, and you know, I feel like, you know, photographer, that's like the general like title, but I feel like it's like artiste like there's a, there's more to it that i got because image curator i don't know what the <laughs> exact words but you have been able to go beyond just taking pretty pictures but mm -hmm. to expose something that isn't often seen um and that is the the joy and the happiness um from black people and black lives like so much of our environment and our world capitalizes and makes money off of the pain yes. and suffering of black folks so let's talk about first of all your career and mm -hmm. just what like coming into photography what was it that led you to specifically say you know what i mm -hmm. want to do photos focusing on black folks and happy black people well, there was definitely a journey from the time that I decided to shoot Happy Black People, but it all started in 1998, 1999. I saw the movie Love Jones. Ah, we um, love Love Jones. And I became obsessed with Nia Long's character um, because she was a photographer in the movie. And, um, you know, she was all about that entrepreneur life, you know, book, trying to book gigs in New York City. I think they were uh, filming it in Chicago. And... Me being from Philadelphia first, I was a part of the Dirty Backpack Click. So that was with, dirty you know. Dirty Backpack Click. What, if you what? know, you know. <laughs> well, wait, what's the Dirty Backpack Click? Oh, Tell us about it was that. just all about like the incense and the uh, <laughs> shea butters. And uh, I got so you. I got it was, you. It, yes. was, it was like the Erica Badu's and, um, and um, you know, India Ares and Jasmine Sullivan performing at, uh, I forgot what the spot is called in Philly. But, you know, it was all about just the Neo Soul movement. Wow. That's what you consider like the Dirty Backpack Click. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But so me being from Philly, me, you know, having that in the back of my head, seeing that movie, I immediately was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be a photographer. So wow. my from mom, seeing the movie. from seeing the movie. Now, I just want to pause on that for mm -hmm. one second, because 
I think that is, <laughs> I just want to pause and recognize for a mm, moment that mm -hmm. how important it was mm -hmm. for us to see images like Love Jones. Because I remember when I saw Love Jones, it inspired me to kind of think mm -hmm. that, you know, black love and just mm -hmm. the poeticness about it. And yeah. just, I mean, obviously it didn't show up a, a perfect you know, picture of love, but love is real. not perfect. Absolutely. But I think Absolutely. not only the fact that Neil Long was a photographer in the movie, but I think the, the, the movie itself was so cinematically shot. Mm -hmm. Was that also part of what pulled you in? Absolutely. There were certain scenes that would never leave my mind. I mean, the scene when they were going from one spot to the other on a motorcycle driving through, I forgot what park in Chicago, um, it was just so beautiful. And I think uh, Lorenz Tate was smoking a cigarette and she passed, he passed it back to me along. And it was just shot so well. Then it was another scene when they were dancing in this uh, reggae club. And oh, it was just I like scene, lights yeah. on it. I think it was like this high angle shot. Um, and it was just like they were perfectly lit in the middle of the room while everybody else was kind of dim and your focus was specifically on them. So, yes, it was a combination of the character you know, being a photographer, and then the way how it was shot. Um, so all of that, but it's funny because, like, not only, not up until maybe a couple of years ago, you know, I always heard the phrase representation matters. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then when I started really, like, connecting the dots, I'm like, yo, if I've never seen that movie, I probably would never have wanted to be a photographer. Wow. It was that specific. It was, because I remember it. I was sitting, I went to, uh, I went to the movie on like April 12th. My birthday was on April 14th. You know the date. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. I went with one of my homies. His name is Talib. Um, we were in high school together. We had, our birthdays was two days apart. And we, he sat in front of me. I sat behind him. Um, and I just remember like if I was not in that place in that time, I probably would have not been a photographer. Well, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's back up a little bit. Okay. So before, because before I get to the, to the history, mm -hmm. Let the people know. Break break out the phone. Uh, like I need him to break out the list. So break out. Tell the people, cause we need to celebrate. Like tell the people all the different brands that you have worked with. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, um, I work with Target. I work with Google Wallet, uh, Puma, Facebook, Sperry, Lululemon, uh, Propel Water, which is under Pepsi. I work with J.C. Penney's, Coors Light, Anheuser Busch, um, MTV, BET. Uh, Hard Rock Hotels, Walmart, Nike. I mean, I mean, the list goes on. The list goes on, y'all. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. just and and the images. Mm -hmm. uh, so, not only have you collaborated with those brands, but mm -hmm. you also have published your own book. I did. It's called Happy Black People. Is that what it's Absolutely. called? Absolutely, it's called Happy Black People. And so, so once I decided to be a photographer, um, I picked up my first camera in two thousand. Yeah, the year two thousand. That's when I graduated high school. My mom got it for me. And I then ended up going to Art Institute of Philadelphia to study photography. But this was around a time when internet was still very new. You know, no one had portfolios on website. The only other photographer I knew at the time was my teacher, right? So to be honest, like when I left Art Institute of Philadelphia, I didn't know that I could do this full time. So I spent most of my young adult life doing um, like digital advertising and marketing. Um, but then fast forward to around 2012. So as everybody knows, I always get hate for this, but I have an Android. I just always like that. <laughs> oh my I've been God, an, an Android. Listen, listen, I'm not gonna, that's another topic. Oh. That's another podcast. I mean, it's okay. But listen, I'm not <laughs> going to be like wrong that. With I'm not, there's nothing wrong. Listen, So there's nothing to be listen, okay. <laughs> I'm not out here shaming. <laughs> there Thank is you. nothing wrong with having an Android. Anyway, once <laughs> Instagram came to Android, um, then I was like, okay, I'm going to use Instagram to kind of like just showcase my creativity side. And I wasn't taking selfies at the time. I was mostly taking pictures of my friends, um, on my phone. And then people oh. were asking me like, yo, what kind of camera do you have? Um, uh, I was like, it's an Android. Cause of course Android always take better pictures. <laughs> that I will give you that. I will give you that. The camera on that Android is, is beautiful. So, um, so yeah, so then um, a friend of mine, he was running a blog. Um, and he was like, yo, do you want to take a pictures of us? I was like, cool. Um, and prior to that, I would never even picked up a camera since 2000. So it's been like 12 years of me never picking up a camera. So when I got his camera, he had like a Canon T3i Rebel. Um, and I started taking pictures. I was like, oh, yes, I missed this. This is what I love. 
Um, and it was more like on the editorial side, right? So as soon as uh, that shoot happened, the next day, I bought that camera, right? Wow. So that was around 2012, 2013. Um, so but you point, started with an iPhone. I mean, with not, not <laughs> You started with the with the phone, <laughs> with the phone. I started, with and I the just want to. I'm I'm pausing sometimes in these in as he's telling his story because I acknowledge and I understand that when it comes to building a dream, mm -hmm. you cannot make excuses about what equipment you do and don't have. You have to find a way to access your dream now, and if you have the vision for it and you have the feel for that, I think that that's you will find a way like those who say they want to be singers. Some folks are just talking and fantasizing because those who are really want to be singers are singing at birthday parties and bar mitzvahs and anywhere that they, somebody will hold the stage. Mm -hmm. I want to go back uh, just another second too, because I want to ask you, you said that graduating high school, mm -hmm. your mom bought you mm -hmm. a camera. Mm -hmm. You also said you went to school mm -hmm. for art. For photography. For photography. Mm -hmm. Now, me personally, when I was going to college and doing all those things, like my parents come, you know, come, we come from a background where like my, my father worked like a factory job. My mom was a teacher. My mom is a teacher. And they're all about stability, you know, get that job with the, mm -hmm. you know, so when it came mm -hmm. to like writing, mm -hmm. acting, for t art of any kind, mm -hmm. it kind of was like, shone upon so talk to me a second about like your experience growing up and have did you always have support from your fa your parents my mom yes i was lucky enough to whatever creative outlet that i wanted to explore she was able to help me with that and help me to explore it i started playing the clarinet in fourth grade and then transitioned to um saxophone from ninth grade all throughout high school um, but simultaneously, you know, I took theater classes during the summertime at Freedom Theater in Philly. Um, I was in a marching band, jazz band, jazz wow, choirs. So, so I was doing it all. I was doing a lot. I was very much into the creative spaces, and I was lucky enough to have my mom's support. So, Do you think that doing all of those different types of things, because, you know, I think in today's day and age when folks are coming up, People take things so seriously in the sense of, mm. like, when you're creative, if you pick up one thing that you got to, like, now I got to be a professional clarinet player, mm -hmm. you know, but as those of us who are considered to be multi-hyphenates or mm. people are like, wow, you're creative, you do this and you do that, mm -hmm. um, do you feel like being exposed to various different types of art helped you or do you, you know, because I feel like as an artist, none of it's wasted. I mean... Has it helped me? Yes, it's definitely had because creating, um, being a creative is multifaceted. And it, if you're not necessarily creating something visual, still creating like a, a mood or a vibe. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the way how I'm going to, you know, tie in my music with my photography is I know a lot of times when I'm on these commercial sets, right? I, the majority of the times each set that I'm on, and depending on the uh, the talent that I'm uh, actually shooting, I create custom playlists that kind of like goes in with their personalities to pull the best out of them. And it's a small, it's like a very small thing to when I'm on these larger sets, but it's it huge. adds so much. As someone who is modeling in front of cameras a lot, and yeah. like I usually have to put my phone on. To exactly. be like, they, because they'd be like, what you want? I, I want already, Beyonce. If I already did my research on the person who I'm shooting and I kind of like get an idea of what their what their aesthetic is like, mm -hmm, what they mm -hmm. like, um, and I put that into music, like it's it's a communication that's uh, really, you can't really describe, but it's a, it's a communication that's understood. And then they're able to like just let loose a little bit more. That layer between like photographer talent is then that wall is broken down. That's amazing. So, and I think as an artist, so, you're, you're showing that where you're thinking about more than just the image. Absolutely. Because yeah. I'm also, and that's the thing that I was tying it back to. I'm not just creating good imagery. I'm creating a good vibe on set that I will always be remembered by. And because that vibe also, comes across on the image. So like, you know what I cause mean? Because people are able to see something that's authentic and something that's super staged. You know what I mean? And then also, like, my goal is not just to, when I'm on these sets, is not just to also create 
good imagery, my goal is also to create an experience where I can get rehired because as an entrepreneur, your last job could be your last job. You know what I mean? And sometimes... Well, okay, wait. So, okay. So, let's talk about that for a second because as we sit here talking about this, obviously, we're talking about a lot of the the highlights, right? Mm -hmm. We've worked with all these great companies, you know, great time in school, mama supported you, all the great things. But I know that none of that was Mm -hmm. easy. Oh, no. How, like, number one, I feel like it must have been challenging to curate a space where you are an authority on black images Mm -hmm. when, again, the world wasn't necessarily communicating that there's value in that, that we see value in that. Mm -hmm. How did you, what were some of the challenges, I think, I guess, that you faced early on? So, again, I consider myself a lifestyle commercial photographer, right? Lifestyle commercial photography has a history of predominantly white photographers, white males and white females, mostly white males. Um, And when anybody starts off with shooting, they shoot people who, if you're trying to build your portfolio, you shoot people who you have easy access to. My easy access or my friends who just happen to be black, right? Um, And the majority of, even before 2020, before the whole George Floyd thing, with the brands that I already knew in mind that I wanted to work with, you know, those brands, those diversities are just sprinkled in, right? Unless it's like Black History Month or unless it's, you know, something that's very targeted to the AA community. Um, But my goal was to not have things specifically targeted to the AA community, but still have Black people um, being able to be used as once you see their images, you're not just seeing them black. They're also participating in whatever scenario that um, when you see a majority of these brand, these advertisements that are going to like to the masses, to what's just called general audience, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. whatever scenarios they're in, you know, I want to, I like want to go to the beach that. Or exactly. S- skating. Rock climbing or rock, skating yeah, or yeah, yeah. working out also. So like that was my goal. Um, and that's, so with that understanding, one second. hold on, yeah. Move, um, can you see or like? I think if you just hit one or something. Um, oh, there, yeah, we, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, so some of the challenges that I had is when I first got signed. Right. Um, the first agency that I had, they were very aware that I was very green and I was very eager to get into this industry, but one of the uh, the feedbacks that I've gotten when um, after me being signed and I was just constantly doing test work with being very intentional with the images that I'm producing Um, but one of the feedbacks that I've gotten was I need to shoot more white people so the question you asked me is you know how did I get and I mean if they're saying you now now because I want to like pause on that like because that sounds number one rude but at the same time it, it to in my mind it sounds to them and to me, not that it's right, but it mm-hmm. sounds like, okay, maybe they write if the mainstream market or the general market is, you know, and like a lot of times we're talking to white people, we're trying to be commer- being commercialized or mainstream is making sure that you white famous or you, you know, you appeal to white <laughs> people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can understand the notion, I guess. Mm-hmm. But what made you what what made you go beyond that notion of of because did you understand where they were coming from on that on that? Yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes, it's like not saying that any of that is valid. By the right. way, not saying no. That. Sure, I get it. But the point that I wanted to prove with all the test imagery that I was doing to appeal to these mass clients is I wanted to show my composition. I wanted to show my lighting. I wanted to show my directing skills. I wanted to show so much more that the last thing you should really think about is the color of the skin. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there is a bit of a formula when it comes to lifestyle photography. Um, And, but I want the, the main formula is I didn't want to necessarily use all white people, you know, as the mm-hmm. being, I wanted to break that rule, but pay attention to everything else because I'm acing everything else. So that's what you should be paying attention to. Yes, right. Yes, and yes. so again, like I said, sure. If I wanted to just, you know, 
easily just my thing was I didn't want to just grab a white girl or a white guy because I also like again I didn't have a lot of access to just anybody and everybody you uh -huh, know uh -huh. and because I was super new I didn't necessarily go the route of going to a modeling agency I just wanted to because like if I mess up like I didn't that's that's their career on the line like yeah, I didn't yeah, want to yeah, yeah. so I legit was just grabbing on my friends and um but did you know at the time when you were grabbing your friends did mm -hmm. you know at the time that because in acting, we have a, a whole category of basically like character actors. Mm -hmm. And for character actors, they want everyday looking people mm -hmm. of all shapes mm -hmm. and sizes mm -hmm. and what have you. So I feel like you kind of maybe even by doing that just stumbled upon what was also lacking is seeing images of people who aren't about perfection. Absolutely. Absolutely. I made sure that I got people who remind me of my cousins or my sister, or, you know, my aunt. Um, so I definitely wasn't necessarily just going after the people who just look good. You know, I went after people who had personalities mm -hmm. um, and who were able to just, like, you know, bring something different to what people see, which is you see it way more now. You know, you see a good range of representation now than before when I first started. So I was definitely, like, kind of, like, on that wave before it's now, like, trendy and acceptable now. So <laughs> tell me what what would what would you see if you were thinking about all of the shoots that you've done, mm -hmm. maybe for all the brands or all the different people friends that you shot. What pops out to you as like your most memorable shoot? Well, it's not necessarily with the brands per se. It's the fact that I'm able to hire people. My my crew are people who were with me from the beginning before I even started shooting, mm. right? So mm -hmm. the people who I would actually test shoot on, they're are part models. of my crew. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 more so my assistants oh, that okay, travel yes, with me you. to every job. But you're making sure they're paid as a part of the crew. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. my day ones, um, Alex Sanchez is my homie, um, CJ Hart and Gabe Nacito. Uh, those are my first, second, and third assistants. So... Th one of the highlights of just my career is the fact that I'm able to work with these major corporations and bring the people who I really came up with and help me get me That's there. amazing. That's amazing. And I, I've had a chance to actually hang out with you and your, your people. And, like, mm -hmm. I, I, it's just, first of all, they're great. They have great energy. But also, mm -hmm. we talk about shooting regular people, but also your <laughs> friends are extremely <laughs> beautiful. Like, yeah. I mean, gorgeous. Alex Wright is the one that's like 40 something. <laughs> He's going to kill me. <laughs> but he yeah, looks yeah. incredible. I mean, yeah. he looks right. I mean, you look great too. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. You know, because we all are in that, um, we all in that little older <laughs> club. And um, so let me ask you this. So what, as far as like, okay, so I know that that was a challenge shooting just black images and mm. like be now finally carving your own niche out for that in this environment mm -hmm. that we're in um how has your environment because basically um this <clears throat> podcast no opportunity wasted generally talks about opportunities and challenges but i kind of contextualize a lot of this uh with buddhist philosophy and mm -hmm. just i'm trying to give the people what we call a new common sense because mm -hmm. basically buddhism is reason it's not about oh you should believe in this and you need to believe in that but if i can connect people to the concepts that are really powerful i think it'll it just give people access to something that has been um, tainted by dom people trying to dominate and spiritually abuse people. Mm -hmm. So there's something that we talk about called oneness and environment. And it's basically a concept that gets you to understand that you are not separate from your environment and that no matter where you are, your environment is reflecting to you something about where you are, what you're struggling with, uh, your value, what you do, what you do value, what you don't value, what you desire, what's uh, elusive to you. So has, have you found yourself to always feel like you're in an environment that has been fertile ground for you to develop? Or have there been moments when you felt like you needed to change your environment? And I and I even I'm a pre preface this by saying you know when we talk about this, we understand that 
really the change that's happening when we need to change our environments, when we need a change of scenery or any of those things is really the change in us Mm -hmm. to then change our environments. So so as your (laughs) journey was going through, was there anything in you? Because you talk about being in Philly. Mm -hmm. I think you've been in New York. Mm -hmm. And now you're in L.A. Mm -hmm. What has been the call for you? What? How is your environment um, played a part in your sort of development of when it's time to like be here and really dig into my environment as well as that thing that tells you I need to leave this environment? I think the environment more so for me was a state of mind um, because it didn't necessarily have to do with where I was physically, but it was mostly the state of mind. And what changed was mostly... Um, it was I was my motivation was my frustration because I work in these corporate jobs prior to so when I picked up the camera in 2012 after shooting um, my friends, um, you know I started shooting more and I started shooting more right and I was what was happening was um, the work that I was doing I was at first I was liking it I was working at these companies like Complex Magazine BET doing ad operations. But as more as time and time has went on and I started shooting more, I realized that that was kind of like more of my calling. And I realized that the job, my nine to five, um, I was kind of like hating more and more. Mm. And, you know, all the jobs that I mentioned too, all those jobs I got fired from too, because like my attention just not was there anymore. Right. Mm. So mm-hmm. what happened was, you know, my mind went, I had my last job, which was with Spin Media, right? Um, I was like, I had around $30,000 in my bank account at this time. Um, I kind of knew the direction where I wanted to, you know, do with photography, but I still had like no idea with, you know, really how to get from A to Z because Mm -hmm. it was so far fetched. Mm -hmm. But I just knew that if I didn't do anything at this point, then I would regret it. Mm. Um, I knew I also didn't want to be one of those people who, you know, there was a lot of people who I was kind of like, you know, associating myself with. And they were kind of, we were all starting our entrepreneurial paths and our creative fields. And I also didn't want to be one of those person that looked back and seeing where they are. Uh-huh. And then I'm still like depressed or stuck in uh-huh. what I was doing. So uh-huh. like I was figuring that out. Um, and it, w- but it was mostly like, if I don't do this, I will regret it, and if it nothing, if it doesn't work out, then um, I'm just gonna move back into my mom's basement back in Philly. Mm-hmm. So, like the environment was more so in my mind, and it was more so on like survival mode, mentally surviving because I was just like, I gotta do something. I cannot. And I remember one time. Okay, so journey. I, I'm very specific with dates. I mm-hmm. think it was around January 12th or 13th. I mentally made up in my mind. I'm like, I was crying. I was like, I can't do this no more. Right. I can't work this nine to five no more. I was working in the city. Uh, I was living in Brooklyn, and the entire ride from New York to Brooklyn, I was bawling on the train. Wow. I was bawling on the train. I was like, "Yo, what am I going to do? Because this ain't it no more. This nine to five. Uh-huh. I don't. I've never prior to that. I've never quit a job without looking for another job. Without having something, something t- yes, lined yeah. up, right? So I was like, "Am I really about to do this? Am I really just going to take time off and focus on photography?" I cried all the way home. Wow. January fourteenth, two thousand sixteen, is when I submitted a letter to my job. I'm saying effective immediately. I'm canceling. And after that, um, I moved to Brazil for about three months um, to do my whole eat, pray, love thing. I, I was yeah, trying to figure yeah. out what I was going to do. Um, first of all, I just got to say, as a black man, mm-hmm. I am just, first of all, proud of you for taking these moments for yourself. Like like you said, like you're sitting on a train and you're thinking about going left or going right. And I just feel like for black men, and this is something that for black people in general, because I think that we're told as kids growing up and everything is just like a lot of what we're told is about how to stay safe, Mm -hmm. not just stay safe, how to play it safe, Mm -hmm. like play it safe. So you're not quitting a job with nothing lined up. You're not going to Brazil Mm -hmm. and doing your eat, pray, love thing. The more and more I see black people step outside and just take a risk, I know that it, I know that, because I've been there too, I know how scary that was. 
Nigga. <laughs> <laughs> That's all Especially I can say. Especially Brazil? Yeah, no. Nah, like, another thing that was in the back of my head, you know, everybody goes through this when they grow up, but I was like, I think 36. I was like, 36? Like, mm-hmm. I'm old. Like, well, how am I going to start a career all, at 36, like, all over again? So I had Meanwhile, that in that's the back young, of my head. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it was rough. It was really, really rough. Um, the only thing that kind of let me jump off that cliff was the fact that the job that I had was pretty much like a revolving door. So I knew that if shit didn't work out, I was going to probably be able to, like, you know, get another job. But also, I just knew that I did not want to get another job. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But so kind of like going back to what we were talking about earlier, um, I guess the way how I kind of like. Wait, 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 wait. But was that your last? Was that was you said? Was that your last time working for someone else? Yes. Okay. 2016. Yeah. 2016. Spin, spin media. So 2016. So we're talking about seven years. Yes. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Because that's another thing. So again, seven years. That's no light. That's no light time, especially as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So I want you to talk about because I have this saying that we say: some days chicken. Some days feathers. I learned that from um, Nikki Aragus Lloyd, R I R I P Nikki Aragus. But um, some days chicken, some days feathers, and just understanding that when you are no longer on that weekly check schedule, <laughs> that some days you're going to have the full roasted chicken, mm-hmm. two sides, and a lemonade, and other days you're gonna ask them to give you some water in a cup. And some rice or whatever, you know, whatever it's going to be. So, like, how did you get, how did you get by, like, and how did you keep your, I say spirit, Mm -hmm. and I want to break this little, little lesson down too, like, as a, as a, just kind of a Buddhist concept and lesson that I want people out there to understand You absolutely need some sort of practice around engaging in, and I'm just going to explain this in this way. Some Christians and stuff like that, they might say soul, spirit, all those things, right? Um, You hear a lot of people say energy these days and stuff like that. Um, But even just, just think about battery, you know, or energy. Like, okay, let's say there's an energy thing in your chest and your body and you know when you have really low energy you don't got a lot you know there are times when you are like amped up and I got a lot of energy you know there are times when your energy is really optimistic and positive and you know when your energy ain't right and it's everything is negative so I always say that whatever you want to call it your battery your energy your spirit your soul that You have to develop a relationship with that source and know that if your energy is low or if it is feeling a little negative, that you have something that you lean towards that's more positive than negative, right? That has more positive effects than negative. So out of all of these years, what was the conversation like for you as your own cheerleader, as your own spiritual practice? <laughs> like, how did you keep yourself going when it was up and down? Exactly that. It was very much up and down. And I'm not going to try to answer this question with a cliche answer saying, you know, I talk to myself every morning and, you know, I had a routine. No. Unfortunately, when it got low, it got low. Yeah. Uh, I'm very transparent with my depression. And please, it, especially in this case, please. It was being an entrepreneur is hard yes. because the the good thing about you know the trajectory of my career was that I saw I, I didn't I'm not gonna say I saw the light at the end of the tunnel but I very much was clear with and very intentional with what I wanted mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but when things that didn't necessarily work out and you know I was going on that downhill you know I thought it was the end of the world you know I allowed myself to really just allow the negative thoughts run my life Mm -hmm. you know physically Mm -hmm. you know I would spend literally weeks in bed and then you know living in New York I was living in a one-bedroom apartment very small brownstone very tight um 
and when it's cold outside, you know, and if you're, when you're you an entrepreneur, you know, you don't have that routine of getting out your bed every day. So when, and then being that, again, I knew what I wanted to do in terms of lifestyle photography, that means I'm always going to be on location outside. I can't go outside shooting, you know, happy black people or running in the sun or, you know, all that, what I wanted to do in January, February. So at that time, you know, I just didn't know what to do. And I was not prepared because I didn't really also have anybody to talk to to mm -hmm. understand what is the process between January and, you know, June. What do y'all do? Like, I didn't know. So I allowed myself to just really get into some really dark places. Um, and then. How did you get out? <laughs> the sun came out. <laughs> the time switched back yeah. to you know the spring ahead. The time. Well, you know, let, let's and... again pause me here for a second because I'm just saying that like sometimes people, you know, when you're dealing with things, sometimes you have these resources and these you know these people or places that you can go to, and sometimes all you might have is a change of the season. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so at the very least, this is what this is at the very least of what you can count on mm -hmm. is a change of a season. Is mm -hmm. the sun coming up again? Is this too shall pass? So again, you're saying like I ain't have nothing but when that season change. So say so to kind of piggyback off of what you were just saying, um I will say this though. It is a bit easier to understand that seasons do change when it becomes more of a habit or when you become familiar with the four seasons. Yes. Because yes. prior and knowing to that they're coming. knowing where they're coming, because that's the part that really kind of like held me back and not necessarily seeing light at the end of the tunnel from that aspect, see, thinking that, you know, okay, the sun is going to come back out and I will, you know, get a little bit more motivated to continue, you know. But once years have gone past and I've started develop a, developing a pattern, understanding that, okay, yes, I'm just going to go through this period of time. I know what it's going to be like. But to be honest, though, even though when I was going through, you know, when the time goes back, it would get darker earlier. Um, I try to prepare myself mentally and mm -hmm. I would still get lost sometimes, mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. I know I'm, it's going to happen. That seasonal affect disorder is real. It's, it's yeah. very real. It's very real. But um, what kept me... I, to be honest, when people ask me, you know, what kept me going, time, to be honest, like, and it wasn't necessarily a voice in my head to, I got this, I got, it was just like, all right, let me just get out this bed, let me just go do something real quick, mm -hmm. and I remember mm -hmm. the, there were these two test shoots that I've done that kind of really started solidifying my voice as a photographer, but I remember the day of, like, I really woke up, it was like, damn, should I, call? I, I was really, like, this close to be canceling certain things, um, Oof, just because yeah. it was just like, I feel like I was going to wake up and it was just going to be another day. But once I did the shoot, I was like, yo, I'm so glad I did this. And I remember those, I these those specific moments. shoots where the, those images still exist on my portfolio. And those images are still in my treatments that I submit to clients that, you know, align with their whole creative direction because I was just very intentional with what I wanted to do that long ago. But if it wasn't for the fact of me just getting up um me kind of like understanding all right th this this the season is over let me just let me just do what i'm supposed to do mm -hmm, you know let mm -hmm. me do the homework mm -hmm. um and because i was able to understand that that whole uh, approach then i was able to also understand that the seasons do happen and then you know i'm going to get out of it now do but you see hard. do you see yourself sort of taking advantage of of the of the other seasons like uh, does it ever has it ever has it started because i know like right now which again i'm very happy that you focus on happy black people mm -hmm. like you know and those things what has the has there been anything else other than the sun is going to come out mm -hmm. has there anything that those dark times or the other seasons mm -hmm. have taught you i mean has it been anything that those other seasons has taught me? I mean, obviously you're resilient. You know what I mean? Obviously, like, oh, you know. Acknowledging that. Acknowledging my resilience. Mm -hmm. I think because, you know, it is easy to stay in places. And the fact that I was able to come out and always get better and better, 
and then when I was going in it and then still able to come out and just get better and better, acknowledging that, you know, I am growing. Mm-hmm. And I think with that, there you have this level of gratitude that exist and it exuberates through your personality Absolutely. and when you when you kind of remind yourself every time that yo i got out of it i was good then it just makes it easier and easier and that's why it, i don't really experience it as bad as i did you know back in 2016 or pretty much my entire time in new york well think about it this um, way think about the first time that you had a let's say a pay job okay where like all of a sudden okay now i'm taking money for this mm-hmm. and I got to make great images Mm -hmm. to now you getting a job and going to the job. Talk about, because this is what I want people to understand. It's like what you just talked about is overcoming challenges. Mm -hmm. What you just talked about is the fact that in the beginning it was one way, but as you continue to get over each challenge, your resilience grew Mm -hmm. and you were got stronger and stronger. So, I guess, because a lot of people ask me the question, like, Angelica, how are, how are you so confident, you know, about certain things? Mm-hmm. And I always say, listen, um, if you were to ask me to bake a three-layer cake right about now, mm-hmm. I might sweat bullets if you ask me to do it for Meghan Markle's, uh, you know, uh, would they, when you get married again, like, not, I'm, I don't mean, like, marrying another person, but I mean, like, renewing your Renew- vows. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, say, for instance, she, you wanted me to make a cake for the renewing of the vows ceremony for mm-hmm. Meghan Markle, and that was my first time making a cake. Mm-hmm. I would be nervous. Absolutely. I would be very, very nervous. Absolutely. But after making thousands of cakes for people all over the world and doing mm-hmm. all these things, then, yes, I'm going to feel much more confident. So, if you could think of back to that like first time you started stepping behind that camera mm-hmm. till to now, mm-hmm. um, just tell me tell me about what you were feeling when you first started creating those images and mm-hmm. how where your confidence was. So if we're talking about in 2016 after quitting my job, then really going at it really hard, my confidence came from. <laughs> Being a little bit, um, what's the word? Um, not, uh, just like, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, it wasn't necessarily delusion, but just, it was confidence. And I was just, I knew what I wanted to do, right? So the feeling that I had when I got my first job was more so like, Yes, one plus one is adding up. Yes, right. Yes, yes. You I didn't was very, feel uh, you didn't feel like a fraud in the moment. No, like, I was like because prior to that, syndrome. and even yeah, prior to that, and even up until you know me still building my craft, I was just I knew what I wanted to do, and I was preparing myself for doing it, and I was just like, yes, this makes sense for my for me to get this job. Um, so yeah, it definitely, it, I didn't feel any of the type of way, but other than, yeah. That's great. Cause most people, most a lot of people, mm-hmm. you know, have really, really struggle with that. But yeah. That's great. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, we're, we're going to go, we're going to wrap this up mm-hmm. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. So yeah. have you seen what's love got to do with it? Yes. I mean, of course. I mean, we have mm-hmm. a certain age. Everybody yes. has seen that movie. Okay. So tell me like, you know, cause that's a classic Yes. That's like a classic in the black community. Like, mm-hmm. if you ain't seen that, like, your car might give her a bulk tiny. Uh, but what did you think? What, when you first saw the scenes when Tina Turner was like, nam yo ho ring a yo, nam yo ho ring a yo, nam yo And like, when, because I know the, so many black people, we've seen that, but I think most mm-hmm. people either don't think about that moment or like, did that moment did you did it stand out to you what did you thought think about that or buddhism at the time i mean i was young when i saw it so it didn't stand it didn't out register, to me it didn't right. register yeah, yeah. no and of course you know as an adult when you look back at a lot of movies that you've seen you know you look at it in a different way and unfortunately i haven't seen it you know recently to look back at it, at it through a different lens mm-hmm. um well let me tell so you yeah go back Okay. Go back and watch it. And the reason why I want you to go back and watch it, and I, I keep saying this to people, I'm, I'm, I'm like spreading the gospel. You know, this is how I like kind of tell people about Buddhism a little bit. But, you know, first of all, I'm just so grateful for Tina Turner and her life force. 
it's um she's someone whose life force has like circled around this entire world and she is a Nichiren Buddhist. She practiced, you know, chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. She has for so long. Um, and what we know as a part of the practice is that our challenges, um, we always say congratulations because they're, they're, they're part of your journey. Mm -hmm. They're part of what polishes you into the gem that your life is. And almost like, you know, what Christians would talk about, like how, you know, your the cross that you bear, picking that up and that sort of being your your greatest thing, you know, the thing that you think is is the thing that's weighing you down is actually the thing that's bringing you up. Um, what I love about that movie is that I didn't notice when I was younger, right? Because I just, all I saw, and I couldn't even believe actually that I was watching that when I was younger because, <laughs> right. wow. Right. <laughs> the abuse and everything that is in there. And it's what, mm -hmm. that's another conversation. But watching her get wrapped up in drugs mm -hmm. and being controlled by a man who's basically, in essence, like acting as if he's her pimp. You know, pimping her out to the stage, basically, whether she's ready or not, smacking her around, all these things. And there was this, this moment where, you know, Tina was this, like, kind of when you first saw her on the screen, she was this meek, humble woman, you know. But that voice, mm -hmm. the voice that she has, as she started to sing, folks were backed up and they were like, that's coming out of her? And what I think is just, I, I get so emotional thinking about this because the layers to her life is that we all have these moments where we don't understand our voice. We don't know how strong our voice is. We don't have control. We don't know how to wield the, the power of our voice. And she has a powerful voice. And she was in a situation where this man was controlling her voice, was stifling her voice, was doing all these things to the point where she was on camera. I mean, she was on, she was getting ready for her performances backstage. She's putting on her makeup and she's like looking in the mirror and she uh -huh. can't even put her stuff uh -huh. on straight. She's so distracted. She's drugged up. She's, you know, almost not there. Mm -hmm. She's actually going into like this tra trauma response where she's leaving her body and like just going through the motions. She was almost dead. Mm. She was almost dead. You could that's why she deserves every award <laughs> for playing that role. But she was almost dead. And that is how some people are walking around right now in a way in which their life is they they feel so like they have no control over the things that they're the drama and the things that this is just the lot in life I was served the hand I was handed. And then at her when her friend said, "I'm not doing this no more." The moment she said, "Eat the cake, anime," mm -hmm. I'm not doing this no more. The friend leaves out the restaurant, mm -hmm. never comes back. Mm -hmm. And when she, uh, Tina Turner finally decides to leave and goes to that friend's house. Mm -hmm. She sits with that friend and the friend was have been there chanting. And she was like, what was that that you were doing? So the friend shows her, you know, oh, just, just, you know, sit with me to chant. Nam yo ho ring a yo, nam yo ho ring a yo, nam. And she, at first she was like, what does that even mean? You know, whatever. And so I, I, I bring that up because she didn't even know what the words meant before she was handed this tool. Mm -hmm. She just just chant, and this is going to bring out your highest qualities, your wisdom, your whatever. Just sit there in front of yourself and chant. And you watched her be like, nam yo ho, to nam yo ho ring, to nam yo ho ring, a nam, and you just saw like they would do these jump cuts. And all of a sudden, what you realize about the situation is, Ike's being the same abusive, nasty person. What's changing in the situation is her. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, his abuse and his words are starting to bounce off her. You see her doing things like, oh, Ike, she, that she never did before. And all, it's almost as if he's bowing down to that energy as well. She's like shooing him away. 
to until the point where they're now she's fighting for mm-hmm. her life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she's saying, I don't need anything else but my name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I love about that is that is what nature and Buddhism, that is what the practice of Buddhism can do for your life, period, is just get you on that track. But that aside, what I want our, for our people to get most out of that story, too, is just like how you can decide to shift the energy in your life to shift the control in your life and to fight for your right to be respected and valued in your life. And I think that, so I say that in this formal way, but I believe that people, I'm going to always be a champion and introduce people to Buddhism and say, come here, do this and blah, blah, blah. But I'm always also just try to sit here and be a reflection and a mirror to those things that you have access to right now in your life. And not only that you have access to now, but even to be able to look back at your life and look back at those moments where you chose. You chose yourself. You chose your vision. You chose optimism or hope over that other thought. And just knowing that those moments that you were talking about crying on the train or <laughs> quitting the job, these small moments is what it means to win every day in everyday small moments. Cause those little things you talked about, it all adds up, added up to where you are right now. Absolutely. Every step, every tear, every mistake, every, you know, all the money I had to uh, fish out to get the right uh, equipment, um, whether, you know, it broke and I had to buy another one or a replacement, all the studios that I had to book on my own, all the trips back and forth to H&M to buy the clothes and to return it, um, all of that matters. You know, making a conscious mind to, you know, leave my first agent to find my agent who I'm with now, who I absolutely 1000% mm-hmm. love not being and complacent and knowing when to still push yep yep yeah. like everything really mattered that everything that I've done has gotten me to where I'm at right now so well I just want to say congratulations again on just such mm-hmm. an amazing career Thank I know you. that it's going to be even more incredible especially because at oh, yes. some point I'm going to end up in the portfolio <laughs> we're going to figure it oh, out absolutely we got to figure it out because <laughs> I mean look you know um, I mean the material so <laughs> So we definitely got to get in your portfolio. Um, what's mm-hmm. next for you? Do you, mm-hmm. are you, because um, you, you mentioned a lot of things like direction, photography, mm-hmm. direction, whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you, what, what do you, what do you want to see for your life? What's to be next? honest, like in terms of my career as a photographer, I'm on cruise control. So I just want to continue doing what I'm doing right now. Um, but also I really want to continue to give back even in a bigger way to, you know, get more mentors under my belt. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, Again, in a in a space of lifestyle photography, um, there's not a lot of us in that space. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, a lot of people think when it comes to photography that they only have to do fashion or they only have to do celebrity. You know, there's a whole new world that's untapped by a lot of people who look like me who are just not aware. And there's some people who I introduce it to them and they're taking the, they're taking that path and it's working for them. But I just know that there's a lot of other photographers who look at um, – what a lot of popular things that are being shot and it's cool because first of all they have to understand the difference between you know if people are doing photography as like just a creative outlet which is perfectly fine you can explore you can do whatever you want to but if all i want to do is just shed light to the possibilities of where photography can not only fuel your creative uh that creative space in your body but can also you can live off of that yeah and just do that full time yes. Um, so yeah. my goal is to, I really want to um, just continue to mentor no matter how, no matter, I love the mentees that I have with my current agent who's running a mentorship program, mm-hmm. but if I could just get that bigger and bigger well, and listen, bigger for I'm people. Well, listen, I'm going to help you with that so, too. Yes. Because, you know, I run an organization called Trans Tech, mm-hmm. and we, every year we have a Trans Tech Summit, and basically what it is, it's. You know, for folks from the LGBTQ plus community teaching each other, mm-hmm. sharing skills and um, tech skills. And so what's happened is when I created Trans Tech, I wanted to make sure that black and brown people understood 
we need to take the elitism mm -hmm. out of the word tech. Mm -hmm. And folks think, oh, boot camp, coding, mm -hmm. PHP, CSS, MySQL, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But tech is also photography. No. Tech is also lighting. Mm -hmm. And you can be very successful if you take tech outside the box mm -hmm. and you think outside the box. Mm -hmm. You have been successful for thinking outside the box. Congratulations. Thank I you. cannot wait to see what happens next on Cruise Control. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to see what we do on photos. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. And we will be right back. <laughs> that was good. That was perfect. Oh, my goodness. That was I good. mean, we're going to have to edit it down. <laughs> but, like, cause we have, but what we're going to do is the full interview is going to be available both mm -hmm. on the audio um, and on um on uh, our YouTube mm -hmm. when we once once we launch the show, but we'll also be able to create clips. Okay. You know, do uh, sound clips. So when we have that ready, we'll get those to you. But cool. basically, we have shot a lot of interviews. Mm -hmm. um, we're pro almost going to shoot like almost like a half a season before we uh, launch. Mm -hmm. No, not really, because it's like weekly. So we're talking about 52 weeks, basically. So another day. Mm -hmm. But yeah, <laughs> not 52, because we're not doing all 52. Yes. <laughs> no, nah, that was great. Thank you so that was amazing. much. Oh, so what you doing today? Uh, editing some photos from a test shoot that I just did this morning. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, stop recording. I'm sorry. <laughs>